Have you ever felt so tired that you just felt like quitting? Well, we are right in the middle of a series that we've started called The Comeback, and we're talking about just that. How do we not quit? How do we persevere? How do we push through the pain? How do we overcome disruption in our lives? Because this has been a season of disruption for all of us. Now, here's the thing. When you're a runner, the funny thing is that you are actually the cause of your own pain, right? I mean, nobody's doing this to you. It's not coming from some kind of outside source. You're the one who's forcing yourself to run. You're the one who's doing this to yourself. You're the one who's trying to push yourself through this pain. And here's the thing. If you are the source of your pain, then guess what? You can actually be the source of your relief. Because all you have to do is quit. That's it. Here's the thing, a lot of people think that I love running, and I do love running, but here's the thing, there's actually something that I love more than running. I love stopping. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, I know that there's no gold medal waiting for me at the end of the race. I mean, in fact, there was this one time where I finished the LA Marathon, I got my medal, I was super excited to go home and show my kids the medal. I show them my medal, they're really impressed, and they asked me this question. They were like, wow, Daddy, did you win the race? And I was like, uh, no, I came in 1,576. And you know what they said? They said, wow, Daddy, that sucks. 1,576, that's awful. You should be ashamed of yourself. Now, in my own defense, that was against 15,000 other people, but at the same time, I get it. When the race doesn't mean anything, when the loser gets the same medal as the winner, when I'm gonna end up losing toenails and being sore for weeks, why continue to push through the pain? Why not quit? Why deal with all this pain and interference and disruption that's going on. And here's the thing, maybe you find yourself in the same boat. Because school started just this past week, you haven't even figured out how to log into Google Classroom, and you're the teacher. I mean, maybe you're an administrator, maybe you're, a, maybe you're on a school team, and it, you almost feel like you're public enemy number one where you didn't start this global pandemic. Maybe you're a counselor right now and you feel like you have to deal with this absolute flood of communication coming your way. Maybe for you, you're a student. You're really disappointed that you can't go back to school physically, that you can't hang out with your friends. And it's so easy to think at this point, well, you know, I'm just so far behind. The pain and effort of everything that we have to do is so high then maybe I should just quit. Maybe I should just give up. And if that's you today, I just want to put a little fuel in your tank. I just want to put a little pep in your stat. Because you know what? Yes, today it may represent the bottom of the barrel, but you know what? It could also be the beginning of the most amazing comeback story ever. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Joshua chapter 6 with me. Joshua chapter 6, what we're going to look at is Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. Joshua chapter 6 says this right here, starting with verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hand, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, every man straight in. So previously, on the book of Joshua, if you don't know too much about the Old Testament, what you're going to find is that Israel has just been freed from captivity in Egypt. They've been wandering around the wilderness for the past 40 years, and now finally they're at the point where they're about to realize the promise that God made to Abraham 300 years before that, and now they are about to inhabit the promised land, the land that is now 
flowing with milk and honeys. But here's the thing about that. They're going to face a couple challenges as they go into the nation of Canaan. Number one, Joshua has to lead about a million to two million people across the Jordan River at flood stage, which is about a mile wide. There's no bridge. He's got to lead a million people over a mile wide body of water. They are about to go in and invade Canaan at its midpoint, which military strategists like to fondly refer to as a suicide mission. Believe it or not, that's what General MacArthur did during the Korean War. He invaded Incheon right in the middle of Korea. And all of a sudden, you are surrounded by enemies on all sides at that time. Now, here's the thing. To make matters even worse, God then goes to Joshua and says, I know that you're about to do something that they actually discourage in the princess bride, which is never to be involved in a land war in Asia. But here's what I want you to do. Before you go off and fight the battle, I want you to circumcise all of the fighting men. So try selling that one. You know what I'm saying? Hey everybody, we're right about to invade the city of Jericho, but first, a little team building activity, which is crazy, right? So needless to say, you have all of these fighting men, they're feeling a little bit weak, feeling a little bit woozy, feeling like maybe uh, their fighting voices are just a little bit higher. All of a sudden, they get to the city of Jericho, and believe it or not, the city of Jericho is not a huge city. In fact, archaeologists say that the city of Jericho is not that much bigger than our church property. Our church property is about 10 acres. They say the city of Jericho is only about 12 acres, so not a big city. However, what you will find is that it is small, it's a small city surrounded by a very big wall. This is intimidating. The Israelites have never seen a walled city before. But you know what they have seen? They have seen the Lord of the Rings. And if you've seen the Lord of the Rings, you know that there are four different ways that you can attack a walled city. That you can either go over the wall, like the Romans were famous for. You could dig a tunnel and go under the wall. You could go through the city gate. Or you could surround the city and you could starve it out. So you could go over the wall, you could go under the wall, you could go through the city gate, or you could surround it. Why don't you say that with me? You could go over, under, through, or surround. Those are the four different ways that you attack a walled city. All of a sudden, God shows up with corn cob pipe and a pair of aviator sunglasses like he's General MacArthur, and he says, you know what? I love those plans, and they're pretty conventional, but I got a plan that's even better than that. Here's what I'd love for you to do. I want you to walk around the city once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day, I want you to walk around the city seven times. I want you to pull out your musical instruments at that point. You don't, you, don't, you don't look like football players. You look a lot more like marching band people. So I want you to pull out your musical instruments. I want you to go ahead and serenade them. I want you to blow your trumpets. Then I want you to yell. What are they going to yell? Ah! La, 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 la. Cream cheese! I don't know. I don't know what they're going to yell. But that was God's plan, right? So God wants them to circle around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, circle around the city seven times, blow your trumpet, yell, and then the walls are going to come tumbling down. Now, here's the thing. I'm not God, and I think that's pretty obvious, right? Thank goodness. I am not God. But you know what? That plan to me sounds as good as that whole team building activity thing. Because here's the thing. If God were to come to me and say, here's a plan, you know what I would say? I would say this. I would say, you know what, God? I think that's a pretty good idea. I mean, I know you're perfect, but it's hard to bat a thousand. Pretty good idea. But can I just add to that idea a little bit, God? Here's what I think would be good. Let's go ahead and keep your skeleton of a plan. But... Every day when they circle around the city, why don't we make it so that cracks start to form in the wall? 
every day when they circle around the city, why don't we make it so that a couple of those blocks fall off the wall? That way, the first day, they would see the walls start to crack a little bit. Second day, they would see the blocks start to fall down. By the time, God, we get to the seventh day, you know what's going to happen? People will just start racing around the building and blocks will start falling off the wall like it's Tetris or something. Because here's the thing, that if we want the people of Israel to be motivated and believe in your plan, they've got to see progress, right? It's almost like your diet plan. The most important thing that all of us need to see in a diet plan is we need to see progress. We need to know that what we're doing is working, that the numbers are changing, that the needle is moving. But God wants to know something else. God wants to know, will you keep walking even when it seems like it's not working? Sometimes we're like, you know what, God, I tried tithing. It doesn't work. You know what God would say? You tried twice. Will you keep praying even though things aren't changing? Will you keep doing online school? Will you keep doing online church even though you don't necessarily feel like it? Because that's what faith is. And that's what God wants to build inside of us. This faith and this confidence and this trust that even though we don't necessarily see it, that we would choose to look through our spiritual eyes instead of our physical eyes. Now that's the plan as God relays it to Joshua. Now Joshua has the task of taking that plan and telling the people of Israel that. Now what's interesting is this, that Joshua, I don't know if he lacks faith in God's plan or I don't know if he lacks faith in God's people because it's almost going to be like a telephone game. You, you, do you, have you ever played a telephone game? Telephone game is when one person tells somebody else something and then somebody else tells somebody else that same message and that message starts to change a little bit over time. God tells Joshua, here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk around that city for six days. And then on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. Blow your trumpets. Yell, wall's going to come falling down. All of a sudden, Joshua goes to the people. And the people are like, you met with God. That's amazing. What did God say? What's the battle plan? What's going to happen? You know what Joshua says? Joshua says one word. Verse 7 says this, and he ordered the people, advance. March around the city with the armed guards going ahead of the ark of the Lord. Wait a second. He didn't mention anything about the six days. He didn't mention anything about the seventh day or the musical instruments or the screaming or anything. He just says one thing. He advanced. You think maybe Joshua's leaving out a couple things? It's almost kind of like when I get home from work, my wife asks me, so how was your day? I say, it was good. My day was fine. And Andrea says, wow, you have a tremendous gift for editing. If you can take eight hours of your day and condense it down to one word, fine, good. But that's exactly what Joshua does. You know what the plan is? See that city over there? Advance. That's it. And that's what the people end up doing. And the Bible says this in verse 14. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And they did this for six days. So I want you to think about this for a second. On the first day, they were all ready for battle. They were all raring to go. They were all dressed up with their armor and their equipment and their weapons and everything. They march around the city one time, and then all of a sudden Joshua goes, okay, everybody, okay, great job. Let's bring it in, bring it in. You guys did awesome today. Here we go. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Jericho, Jericho, hey, Jericho. Guys, you did awesome. And everybody's sitting around going, what? Did awesome? I thought we were going to go to battle. And guess what? On the second day, they do the same thing. Circle around the city. Now, on the first day, you might be able to call that a recon mission. But on the second day, everybody's thinking, what's going on here? How come we're not taking the city? How come we're not fighting? They did this on the third day, 
fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. On the sixth day, they end up going back home to their wives, and their wives are like, okay, so tell me everything that happened. How's my little warrior? How's my big, fat, killing machine? Come on, show me some pictures. And they're like, I I don't know. Like, I'm just kind of struggling. Honey, I thought we were going to take the city, but I don't know what's going on. Could it be that they got to the seventh lap of their seventh day that they were discouraged and that they wanted to quit, not knowing that the walls were right about to come down? That they wanted to quit not knowing that the finish line was right in front of their face? Every time I run a marathon, what you're going to find is that there are all sorts of signs out on the marathon race course in order to help motivate some of the runners. Some of those signs are kind of funny. Some of the signs read uh, things like, Chuck Norris never ran a marathon. Some signs say, run like you stole something. Some signs say, that's not sweat. That's liquid awesomeness. Now, those aren't the signs that are most important to me. The signs that are most important to me are the ones that say, two miles left to go. One mile left to go. 200 yards left to go. Because you know what they're telling me? They're telling me this. Don't quit. Keep going. The finish line is right around the corner. Have you ever been in an exercise class with somebody who loves to exercise? I hate those people. You know, because maybe you're in a spin class and the instructor's like, hey, who's with me, everybody? Everybody's in pain, but that one person's like, woo! The instructor's like, hey, who's excited to be here? And that one person's like, woo! See, I don't know about you, but I don't exercise for exercise sake. I exercise so I can eat a dozen Krispy Kreme afterwards. And for me, whenever I'm in that exercise class, the most important thing that I need from that instructor is this, for that instructor to say, hey guys, three more, two more, one more, and you are done. That's what I need from the instructor. Here's the problem. You know what? Life doesn't give that to you. Life doesn't say, you know what? Two more weeks and we'll have a vaccine. Life doesn't say, you know what? Two more months. Don't worry. Two more months and the kids will be back in school. You know, if somebody were to come to me and even say, you know what? In six months, life will return completely and totally back to normal. If that were the case, I would be able to endure those six months no problem. But we don't know that for sure. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know where the light is at the end of the tunnel. And so a lot of times, you know what happens? We feel angry. We feel feel irritable. We feel upset. We feel emotional. And God has brought me here today to tell you this, that you just cannot give up. That you cannot give up. You know why? Because this might be the major that sticks. This might be the marriage that works. This might be the day that your kids finally get it. That, you know, breakthrough might be just around the corner. My favorite ultra marathoner, his name is Dean Carnassus. He says this, run if you can, walk if you have to, crawl if you must. Just never give I don't know about you, but I feel the spirit of Dory coming upon me right now. You remember what Dory said in Finding Nemo? She said this, just keep swimming. I need you to say that with me. Just keep swimming. Because with every day and with every step, 
you're just getting that much closer to the finish line. And here's the thing. Part of the reason why we can't quit is because you and I come from a long history of non-quitters called Christians. People who have endured hardships, people who have overcome persecution, people who have overcome the worst of circumstances because we have the Spirit of God, Spirit that lived Jesus Christ from the dead. We have that same Spirit inside of us. That we come from a long line of people who never quit. Jesus himself showed us what it means not to quit. Because the Bible says what about Jesus? Who for the joy set before him. What is that joy? That's a relationship with you and that's a relationship with me. And because of that promise and because of that prospect, it says this, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That God went through all of that pain so that he could have a relationship with you. And maybe today is going to be the first day where you say, you know what, God? That if it's not just about religion, that if it's not just about do's and don'ts, and if it's about a relationship with my Heavenly Father, then I want to say yes to that. And let me tell you this, when you say yes to a relationship with Jesus, that's not going to make life easier. But you know what? God's going to walk with you every step of the way. He's going to give you the strength to endure just as he endured 2,000 years ago, the cross for you and the cross for me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And if you want to say yes to Jesus and if you want to say yes to a relationship with God, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the faith that comes behind it. But just so I know that you're praying this prayer with me, in the comment section, would you just write down yes to Jesus? Right now, right here, I'm saying yes to a relationship with my Heavenly Father. Why don't you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this message today. A lot of times we feel like quitting because we just don't know how long the road is. We just don't know how much longer this whole thing is going to go. And many times we're not encouraged by the news and by social media that surrounds us. But what we want to do, Father God, is despite what the circumstances tell us, that we want to live by faith and that we want to trust in you. And part of the reason why we can continue, even though everything is falling apart around us, is because, Lord, you modeled that for us and you give us the strength to endure. So today, right now, we say yes to a relationship with you and we ask you, Lord God, to walk with us every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.